stop what you're doing and go to eeriecast.store to check out our brand new merch. I've revamped our merch store, and now we've got new and comfy shirts featuring tales from the break room, unexplained encounters, freaky folklore, and more of your favorite EerieCast shows. Or just grab a shirt of a forest demon. You do you, my friend. Every cell supports our network. That's EerieCast.store. And hey, if you want to be kept up to date on the cool side projects I'm finishing up, such as an upcoming horror fantasy novel and a cryptid card battling game, follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Ah, you ever hear a story that just makes you think about life? Makes you consider things around you for a change? Here, have a seat with me in the break room. I'll buy you a cozy chino on the house. I've got quite a new story to tell from someone who had a long walk to work and a daily ritual to appease the unseen. You see, when a ritual is mistakenly changed or broken, even due to a small mistake, it can haunt you for years. She only wanted some company. From Adrift. This is a story my grandmother, or Nanima as I call her, often narrates at dinner parties. Everyone in the family loves it, so we get to hear it often, in all its terrifying glory at get-togethers. Nanima's a good sport about it, maybe because she's managed to put 60 years between then and now. But even today, I can see in her a remnant of that terrified yet brave young woman she had been all those years back in that fateful summer of 62. To give you some context, my Nanima's family, that is to say, my mother's side of the family, hails from one of the northernmost states of India nestled in the arms of the Himalayas. Surrounded by the beauty of its mountains and their lush green forests, the hilly settlements across this region boast centuries worth of mystical tales that have always fascinated lowlanders like us. Perhaps for me and my cousins, Nanima's tales have been a way to stay connected to our land, a land so many of us haven't been able to call home, not since our families traveled south settling across the various metropolitan cities of the country. It's been a while since I last heard this story, but I've heard it so many times by now that it almost feels like my own. So I have no hesitation in putting it to words the way Nanima would tell it. I'll be her voice, and I'll narrate the story in the closest approximation of her words as translated from our mother tongue. The year was 1962. I had just turned 18 in February. As the only daughter of an influential landowner with modern ideas, I was one of the few girls in the village to take up a job in the nearby town. Most of my friends had been married off by then, and I was often asked to pump out babies of my own by well-meaning neighbors and relatives. But my father was a no-nonsense man who wanted his children to be independent and well off. So I found a job at a government school, nearly an hour long walk from home. Now this was back in the early 60s in rural North India. No one in my village had a telephone back then, let alone a vehicle to call their own. My father had a bicycle he often rode to his farmlands, but none of his children were granted this luxury until they could manage to earn it for themselves. I lived in a small village of farmers and cowherders, which was situated on one side of an expansive valley, and my place of work was a larger town that lay on the other side of it. The journey from one end to the other took anywhere between 45 minutes to one hour on foot, and I gladly walked this winding mountain path twice every day. I woke up as early as four to do my bit around the farm before beginning to dress up for work. I'd be on my way by six sharp, but I would never leave the house without packing pinches of uncooked rice in two pieces of cloth torn from a roll of fabric set aside for this very purpose. I would religiously check my bag twice before leaving to make sure I'd placed these bundles inside. I could forget my employee ID for the day, 
but I could never afford to leave behind these small packs of offerings. The road to town was tough yet hardly a challenge for someone who had grown up in these parts. It wound around the mountain, cut through a valley of flowers, and tapered downwards to where the town sat next to a massive lake. This route I undertook was one out of two traversable paths connecting my village to the town, and the only reason I chose this one over the other was the absolute necessity of saving time. No matter the reservations about certain elements along this route, that were more than just a mere hindrance. You see, the path of my choice was stunning, beyond gorgeous, and it was also comparatively short, an hour's walk between its two ends as opposed to the nearly three hour long trek along the alternate passage. But there was this specific stretch almost in the middle of the route that was capable of ending one's journey forever, and there was only one no way to traverse it, a method that had been in use for decades perhaps even centuries, it seemed. At the 30-minute mark, a small glacier-fed stream almost cut the route into two halves, barely 50 paces in width and passable via a small footbridge built of squeaking wood and frayed ropes, obviously in desperate need of maintenance. The stream itself was nothing special, although it was a part of a larger river. People barely called it that given how insignificant it seemed in that brief stretch along a curve in the road. Its waters were fresh but rarely spirited enough to do more than just gently lap at its banks. But there was hardly anything insignificant about this place. At this juncture, I would pluck one of the two bundles from my purse. I'd stand for a minute or two at the mouth of this bridge, praying for safety in my journey to all the gods I knew of, and I would bend down and placed the bundle gently next to my feet before carefully making my way across. The rule at this point was to never look back, not even a glance. From this point onwards, anyone crossing the bridge had to continue looking forward until they reached their intended destination, no matter where or how far away from the bridge that was. One look back, just one fleeting glance, and it was believed in these parts that you would never be able to reach the end of your journey. The tale had been a thing in our region for at least two generations before me, of that I was certain. There were variations, of course, as is the case with stories seldom put to paper. Some believe it was a restless spirit craving companionship, while others called it a demon keen to make playthings of those foolish enough to cross its path. There were also stories of mothers who had lost their children to hunger and to those mountains, leaving their tortured spirits wandering across these valleys for eternity. More mouths meant bolder stories, and in these mountains I called home, even the skies could not be a limit for the people's imagination. No one really knew who or what haunted that bridge, prowling its diminished length for God knows what, but it was certain that whoever or whatever it was, it had to be appeased for safe passage. The footbridge was barely a few meters long, but in order to cross it safely, one had to lay down an offering of cooked or uncooked rice before setting foot on it. At its head, where the bridge met land and where I began my trek across every morning for five days a week, the ground was scattered with tiny bundles wrapped in everything, from newspaper clippings to torn pieces of clothing, evidence of all those who had taken and continued to take this route. Most of these bundles would be gone by evening, right in time for my walk back across. And although I'm aware this is no proof of some entity haunting the area, what with the possibility of hungry opportunists lurking nearby being high, I doubt anyone belonging to this region would have had the guts to touch these offerings in light of what had been said of the place for generations. Besides, there was also the fact that the place made me feel physically ill every time I so much as approached it five mornings and evenings a week. To this day, I shoot down any and every explanation by my family members aimed at rationalizing my experiences of those days. I see where they come from but I've always and will always stand by the genuineness of my experiences. I couldn't have induced or faked the fear trickling down my spine like ice-cold water, could I? 
I had never been spooked by all those ghost stories my older brothers often told me as a kid. So there must have been some element of truth in this tale to set me on edge like that. Shaken by the local legends and by my own real experiences around this area, I had never once forgotten my daily two packs of offerings or messed up the tiny ritualistic procedure at the bridge. I simply couldn't afford to do so. What with my own thundering heart around this area always reminding me of what was truly at stake. Those wraps of uncooked rice and two pouches would be left without fail every day. It had become muscle memory over the years. The day of the incident, it had rained that morning. It was an important day at school too, some kind of audit involving the local authorities. I was running late. As a result, I was stressed beyond belief when I rummaged inside my bag for the morning's offering. In my haste, I ended up dropping both bundles on the ground at once. I froze on the spot for a few minutes. There was this great rushing in my ears that nearly widened out my vision. Now this may seem like an overreaction. I could have just easily picked up the extra pack and gone on my way. But I've always had this thing where I hesitate to take back what I've already given whether intentionally or not. And with something as charged as an offering meant to keep something at bay, I was even more hesitant to touch the fallen bundle. I was cold and terrified under the untimely rain, half expecting something ghastly to pop out of the water and pull me under right then and right there. But nothing happened. Not within the next few seconds, nor an indeterminate stretch of minutes that followed as I stood there. Unsure, unsure of how to proceed. As the clock ticked and my mind began to clear some of the terror-induced fog it had let gather, I began to see the third and obvious alternative I had failed to notice in my state. I could just let it be and take the longer route back home in the evening. Taking a breath to brace myself, I made my way across the bridge, my every step taken with careful thought and planning but nothing happened. Not then, not later in the day. It was an ordinary day to beat all ordinary days. But I still felt like I was teetering on the edge, barely seconds away from tipping over. Come evening, when it was time for me to return, I had half a mind to stay over at school because the prospect of taking the longer route home in the failing light was no better. But it wasn't an option. The almost three-hour-long route that circumvented the mountain wasn't as taxing as the shorter route, cutting right through the valley, but thirty past five in the upper reaches of the Himalayas, it was most definitely a challenge for a young woman traveling alone. There had been no known cases of any untoward business occurring along this route, but the inky darkness in the hills and wild forests can be a threat all on its own. I wasn't usually the kind to get spooked, but the day hadn't been usual by any means. I was seeing monsters in my shadow, hearing footsteps in the swirling of leaves, and with the ground still soft with the morning's rain beneath my feet, I felt as if I was seconds away from being grabbed unaware. But as had been the case that morning, nothing happened. Apart from the general creepiness of the night and the seemingly absolute darkness of a cloud-covered sky, my journey home was uneventful. Much of the terror I'd been experiencing was a product of my racing mind, awash as it was with shadows that I was tracing with my eyes, because I expected to find them everywhere I turned to look. Later that night, when I finally fell into a fitful sleep somewhere around two, I couldn't help but think if this was the silence before the storm. The next morning, it began with a sort of tremor in my belly like the one you get when you've eaten something wrong and your body's just begun to process the wrongness of it before the churning and cramping starts. I packed two extra pouches this time and placed them in a second zipped compartment inside my bag to be sure. As I prepared to leave, a fierce debate raged inside my mind. I was half tempted to ask one of my brothers to accompany me to work that day, but I rejected the idea the very next second there was no way I was going to alert anyone to my troubles or appear weak in front of them. 
taking the longer route was out of the question. I was wiser today than I was before, and I was fully prepared. So there I was, taking my usual route to work, and all along the half-hour trek to the stream with the footbridge, I was skittish, distressed, and constantly looking over my shoulder. At the bridge, I performed my usual ceremony, with deliberate movements, and I chanted a mantra for courage under my breath. Maybe I was imagining things, but when I bent over to place the small sack at the mouth of the bridge, I felt a strange sense of peace wash over me, a feeling that let me know that I was on the right path, doing the right thing. This was in such stark contrast to my anxiety from merely minutes before that I found myself yet again rooted to the spot for minutes that felt like hours. The peace didn't last long. I had only to cross the bridge for the nerves to return, and with them this time was the distinct sensation that I was being watched and followed. It was nearly impossible to smother my instinct to turn around and look, but I managed somehow. Even today, I won't be able to tell you exactly what it was that I was sensing in that moment. It was something like the soft patter of childlike footfalls and wet earth, barely a few paces behind me. But even if I hadn't been able to sense or hear a thing, I would have known its presence like I knew there was a sun climbing the skies to my right. I knew that not taking this route home yesterday had been a mistake. I was so relieved to reach school unscathed that day. I was shaken and barely keeping it together. If my colleagues sensed something off, they had been kind enough to keep it to themselves. They were too busy with their own responsibilities to bother. Besides, by lunch break, something else entirely had ended up capturing the attention and imagination of every person present within the school compound that day. There had been a break-in, apparently. Some wretch had managed to get past both the guard and the eight-feet-tall walls surrounding the property. The guard was adamant he had not been slacking, and given his stellar record over the years, the administration was disinclined to think otherwise. Nonetheless, it was difficult to imagine how a child, a little girl at that, had managed to not only outsmart a grown man, but also vault such a high barrier in the process. The word was that she had been kept, for lack of alternate arrangements, in an empty classroom, locked from the outside because she had grown violent and bitten the guard when he had tried escorting her out. She'd apparently been spotted in one of the primary classrooms, just seconds before her capture, going through the tiffin boxes of students who had left class for P.E. period. When the guard had tried to reach her, she lunged at him, digging her teeth into his outstretched hands. I didn't join my colleagues when they rushed to the spot to take stock of the situation. I knew somehow that I would not like what I'd see there. I waited for them with dread, barely reading the papers and forms I was attempting to file. When they returned with excitement shining in their eyes, I felt my heart jump right up to my throat. Ten different people gave ten different accounts of the incident. There were exaggerations and massive flights of imagination involved, but at the core, there was this one bit of information confirmed by even the skeptics that made my blood run cold. According to many, the child had eaten but one thing out of the nearly 30 tiffin boxes she had opened that afternoon. Rice. My journey home that evening was just as tense as the morning's trip, except this time, I was sure I felt something brush against my palms intermittently, as if someone was trying to grab my hand before deciding against it. I couldn't see or hear a thing, but I was sure I was not alone. You could argue it was the wind, or perhaps my body's natural response to stress, but I can assure you it had been a very real sensation. I knew in that moment as I walked towards the footbridge yet again that I couldn't abandon this daily routine I'd built out of necessity, and that had now apparently become such an integral part of my life. My daily schedule had been noticed somehow, and if I were to continue existing peacefully here, I had to follow the rules I'd subjected myself to. I wasn't sure what the consequences of deviating from this path would be, 
but I wasn't eager to find out. Starting from that day to the following two years I worked at the school, I never once strayed from the path. Apart from the nearly negligible and occasional leaves I took, I always walked this route without fail, come rain, hail, or storms. But when has life ever been a constant? As the weeks turned to months, which then turned to years, I found myself prepared to transition from one phase to the next. In September of 1964, I was married to a government officer based in Delhi. In our village, this wedding was a grand celebration, and my father, in the spirit of marrying off his only daughter, left no stone unturned. In the chaos and excitement of beginning a new phase, I didn't have much thought to what moving out of this little village could mean, would mean. I was far too preoccupied with the excitement and uncertainties of beginning a married life, with the overwhelming sadness of leaving behind my home and childhood, so considerations of the supernatural variety were left far behind. When we arrived in Delhi, I was immediately picked up by a local women's collective that prepared and sold snacks like poppadums and pickles. I worked the front desk and helped around a bit with logistics and raw materials. It was rather surprising how quickly I'd adjusted to this new life and work environment, and for the first month following my recruitment, I didn't have even a second to sit back and inspect that little something that continued to gnaw at my insides. Not until the strange happenings began, and I was pulled back two years and hundreds of miles away into the arms of the Himalayas. It started with this one incident, where the guard at the front gate informed me I had a visitor asking for me right there at the entrance. When I reached the designated spot, there was no one to be found. The guard had looked just as surprised. According to him, the one asking for me had been a child dressed in tatters, which in itself was alarming. Just weeks after this, some women drying mangoes for the pickles heard a child crying somewhere in the terrace area, and upon investigating every corner of the open surface, along with the rooms attached to it on the topmost floor, they'd found nothing. No one. Two weeks after this, when the storage room had just been stacked up for the monthly output, an inspection round later in the day revealed that someone or something had cut through the rice stacks with a viciousness befitting a wild animal. Naturally, this last incident had me tossing and turning at nights for months. It had hit far too close to home and had shattered the bubble of peace I had built around myself, as if it wasn't going to pop with just a puff or breath. But what was I to do? I couldn't speak about my troubles to anyone, not even to my husband, who was a skeptic himself. My friends and colleagues would probably think I was making things up too. So I swallowed my fears and soldiered on, somewhat assured in the knowledge that whatever this was, it hadn't yet made contact when it could have easily done so any time over the years. There had to be a reason for that. Then I gave birth to my first child, and the rules of this game apparently changed. It was calm for the first few years, so much so that I began to think I'd forever put to rest that one chapter of my past. But my complacency soon got the better of me. 1969 was drawing to a close, and my daughter was months away from turning four. On the work front as well, my hands were full. My office had shifted its base of operations to a district about an hour's bus ride from home. So I was busy for 10 plus hours six times a week. To tackle the workload on both fronts, I'd ended up calling one of my mossies, or auntie, from the village to look after my daughter, and she'd made a home for herself in our guest room. Although fearless and competent, Masi would often complain to us about strange noises and missing objects around the house. I usually would not pay heed to this under the assumption it was the doing of a curious and rather naughty child. Perhaps I was also not ready to think too much about the reasons behind it, for fear of what might be revealed in the process. 
So things went on like this, and my daughter spoke about making new friends around society that would often drop by to say hello. This wasn't unusual to me, because the people in our housing colony were indeed friendly and showered my daughter with love whenever they could. But then, one Saturday morning, something happened that changed my perception of these events. I woke up to a sound coming from the kitchen, and my sleep-addled mind was slow to catch on to the fact that my child wasn't in the room with me. This was one of those occasions where my husband had gone on a work trip, so it was just my auntie in the guest room and me and my daughter in my room. After a disorienting few minutes, when I finally realized where the sound was coming from, I got to my feet in record time, and I ran to the kitchen. I felt the ground taken right out from underneath my feet when I saw my child, my sweet, innocent toddler, out of her bed, pudgy hands searching the cabinet beneath the counter, and fists about to pry open the lid of a massive steel jar we used to store our rice. I don't really remember the weeks following that incident. My mind has probably blocked these memories because I was beyond terrified in those days. I do remember visits to temples and a cleansing puja performed by a family pundit at our place. I remember being scared of my own breathing at times, and I also remember anger. Oh yes, violent, bubbling anger at being troubled like this, and the urgent, almost maddening desire to do something, anything. A cousin's wedding back home provided the perfect opportunity for this intervention. I had finished making the plan before I'd even packed my suitcase for the week-long trip, and by the time I was cocooned in the warm sights of my old home, I'd managed to gather the courage to do what was needed to be done for the sake of my child. On one of those rare breaks between ceremonies, I expressed my desire to visit my old workplace to my mother. She promptly informed me about a new route that was under construction after the footbridge on the old one had crumbled earlier that year. I was beyond surprised to hear this, but I also thought it made perfect sense. In my mind, I was connecting the years spent in Delhi, the initial occurrences after my shift, the peaceful years that followed, and the recent pickup of activities at home right at the beginning of this year. I couldn't put my theory to words, but I still knew it all to be true. Determined, I arranged a massive bag of rice and propped it up on the back of a bicycle, borrowed from one of the workers who had been brought in for the dining arrangements. Finding my way back to the bridge was as easy as breathing, and despite the years between then and now, I still remembered every tree, every errant bush along the path like the back of my hand. I didn't make a show of dropping that sack of rice next to what remained of the bridge. It was barely there now, just bits erected on the sides that had been bent and splintered with age and the elements. I placed the sack as respectfully as I could, and then, for the first time, I sat on the damp earth, feet just inches away from the cold waters of the stream that was still as unremarkable as it had been half a decade ago. I didn't walk away, and I didn't stop myself from looking back. I followed none of the rules. I just sat there, looking straight ahead, anticipating those footfalls that never came. And as I sat, my heart thudding painfully against my throat. I prayed and I begged. I made requests and promises and I tried looking at this whole scenario from a different perspective. I remembered how painful my first few months had been in Delhi away from the home where I'd grown up. I thought of my family and imagined how difficult it would be for me to leave them behind, to watch them leave and never return. To this day, I'm assured in my belief that this hadn't been my intended train of thought. These feelings had just come to me in that moment, gifted to me by some unseen force. In the weeks that followed, I got that bridge rebuilt. I took some more days off work and mustered whatever resources and contacts I could to get the job done. Workers from other villages had to be called in because those living in the region refused to even entertain the idea. But the fact that there was no obvious protest against my decision 
was a testimony to how people around town had been awaiting for someone to take the initiative. If there was one thing scarier than a haunting, it was a wandering, destructive spirit, and no one wanted to be considered responsible for preventing the reconstruction of the bridge. When I returned to Delhi after my eventful trip home, I was far too engrossed in work for the first few weeks to think about my experiences and contemplate the future. Perhaps somewhere in the back of my mind, I had known it was all over. I heard my daughter laugh with abandon, and I found peace in the soft tinkling of her laughter. The cloud that seemed to have been passing over my family had finally dissipated, and for the first time in months, perhaps even years, I went to work, knowing deep in my bones I would only ever worry about deadlines and client interactions that day forward, that my work-related fears, which had seeped into my personal life over the years, would not be of the supernatural variety anymore. It's been years since then, and not once have I felt uneasy or watched. Sometimes, I still have dreams about a child walking by my side, trying to hold my hand, but withdrawing shyly at the last moment. But when I wake up after such dreams, I don't feel a sense of dread washing over me, only a pang of loneliness that ebbs away as the day drags on. I haven't been back to that bridge since, but I hope she's all right, whoever or whatever she was or is. At Home and at Work from Tisa, 26. I work in an army museum in my home country. Way out in the middle of nowhere next to one of the largest training camps in the nation, there is only a tiny town with a bar, a motel, a petrol station, and two takeaways. Due to my job, I live in the camp itself, which has led me to have a number of encounters of a somewhat iffy nature. For a bit of background, I've been raised as and still practice as a Christian, whilst at the same time maintaining a healthy respect and at times involvement in spirituality. This is mainly due to my mother's family having the gift of the sight, though they seem to specialize more in predictions than anything else, going back at least six generations, though it appears to have skipped me somewhat. My father also acknowledges the existence of what many dub the paranormal, but to the three of us, it's simply nature that hasn't been properly studied or explored yet. As a result, the concepts of spirits or ghosts don't fill me with dread or excitement, they're merely as much a part of life as death itself. They simply have to be respected, as one might respect any other person, then there shouldn't be a problem. Though much like the living, sometimes one has to get stern. The first incident was in my old room in the army camp, in a building that hasn't really been improved since the early 70s. Our rooms are individual and locked, and my room was on the first floor, with no fire escape, meaning it's impossible to get in or out through the window. At around 0100 in the morning one day, I woke up abruptly, something that doesn't really happen normally. I found my sheets all scrunched up at the foot of my bed. Still mostly asleep, I blindly fumbled in the dark to grab them and pull them back over me. As I was holding them to my chin, I distinctly felt two hands grip either side of my own and try to violently yank the sheets back down again. Now much more awake, I opened my eyes and I glared straight up at where someone should be leaning over me. I was thinking it was someone who barged into my locked room, intending to give them stick. Imagine my surprise when no one was there. Quickly realizing what the situation must be, I began to speak, bluntly telling whoever it was still tugging on my sheets that it was no longer their room. It was mine, and they needed to let go, or I'd go get the padre, the military priest. The tugging suddenly lessened, with one last yank on the sheets before it stopped entirely. Now, due to the sheer volume of paranormal activity in this camp, I mentioned the situation the next day with some of the older residents of the barracks, 
only to be told that that room had belonged to a sergeant only about seven or so years ago, and that night was the anniversary of his suicide. I've since moved rooms, not related to this incident, and I've not had any further difficulties, at least not in the barracks, though there are certain barracks in this camp where the issues are so bad that some recruits and even senior staff have to carry Bibles around at night. At the museum, it's a different story. There are several areas in the museum where the more sensitive among us get nervous or uncomfortable. Small children often even refuse to go near some of these places, and those that do brave them will occasionally ask about people that aren't there. For the first year or so of my employment, I was usually one of the first people on site in the morning, meaning that I was in charge of unlocking the place and switching on the lights, etc. Clearly able to feel multiple eyes watching me, I began saying good morning to these unseen folks, chattering about current events, the weather, and even singing as I unlocked every morning. I treated them as I would wish to be treated, especially if my soul was trapped in such a place. Much to my consternation, I soon found that one of my bosses who I was struggling with, and occasionally venting about while unlocking, started reporting they felt very uncomfortable in one or two of these areas. In fact, they felt as if they were viciously hated while in that location. Once I stopped talking about the issues, over the next month, that particular boss commented that the fear they felt in that area had significantly lessened, though still they felt disapproved of. The key moment for my relationship with these residents, as we call them, was after a weekend of chaos. All the electronics in the building had been on the fritz, even lights had been going weird. Finally, at the end of the day, I was locking up one of the non-public areas, which is a well-known and feared hotspot for activity, with even the head curator and senior staff steering clear unless it's well lit. I was doing my usual talking to them. I casually said, Well, what set you lot off today? When I said that, the light was still on, and I hadn't opened the door to get back into the public areas. The next thing I remember is being on my hands and knees, about 20 meters beyond the door, panting in the most paralyzing sense of fear, as the door, with the lights off, slammed shut behind me. To this day, I'm not sure if it was my upbringing or something else, but I picked myself up off the ground, my fear almost immediately replaced by murderous fury, a kind of primal rage which truly was disturbing looking back at it. Striding back to the door, I unlocked it, yanked it open, and stepped into the darkness, glaring into it, and in a snarling voice that didn't even sound like my own, I said, If you ever do that again, I'll burn you all. Good night. God bless. Then I slammed the door shut myself. Several years later, I still work there, and while I often see, hear, or feel rather unexplainable things, and at times hair-raising things occur, I've never had anything unpleasant happen. Though the same cannot be said for all my colleagues, many of whom still scoff at the idea, despite their own experiences I've been present for. One of these incidents occurred with three of us present. When leaving the museum, the alarms are naturally the last part of the process, but the building is old, poorly built, and barely maintained, meaning that sometimes things just don't work. When that happens, we have to go through the museum in the inky darkness and see if it's something like an improperly sealed door or some such. On one such event, it just so happened that the three of us, all blokes, were there, and as none of us wanted to go in on our own, we all opted to go in together. Despite checking every door with our phone torches and always staying closed, we couldn't find any issues. Now, inside this museum is a Bailey Bridge, which has some loose wooden floorboards, which make a very distinct thud when stepped on. Knowing there was no one else in the building, we crossed that bridge, and we were discussing what the problem could be on the exit side, 
when all three of us heard the distinct and surprisingly loud thud of the first floorboard of the bridge being stepped on. All three of us shone our torches on the bridge as footsteps began striding across it towards us. As the footsteps came closer, it was obvious in the torchlight that there was no one there. As my two colleagues bolted towards the exit, I rushed out an apology for coming in too late and quickly followed behind them. I also occasionally will have things like drawers slammed as I pass them, especially if it's been a quiet week or if I haven't been talking to them as much as they would like. To this day, I still say my good mornings and update the residents on what's happening in the outside world. They seem to appreciate it, and I must admit that while some staff hate going into any of the hotspot areas, I usually feel comforted and protected in these places. Fresh Air From Volf I was a maintenance worker at an assisted living facility. There were only two of us that helped maintain the facility of over 200 residents that lived there. This facility was newer, having been built in the early 2000s, if I recall correctly, so you wouldn't expect there to be any hauntings or creepy encounters, but you'd be wrong. This encounter comes from our memory care section. There's around 25 rooms in this area for residents requiring extensive care due to their inability to perform day-to-day -day tasks. For the most part, they're the dementia and Alzheimer's residents of the facility. Part of my job was to remodel rooms once they became vacant, whether by the resident moving or moving on, if you catch my phrasing. Part of the remodeling involved things such as removing old cabinetry, replacing outlets, painting drywall, some plumbing, along with any other small improvements needed to make the room upgraded from the original. The room I was in at the time was room 11. It was the largest of the rooms on the memory care side, big enough that the previous resident and their husband both stayed in the room together without issue. I was in the process of tearing out the old cabinets when the thought crossed my mind of opening a window so that the dust didn't fill the air in the room while I worked. It was springtime, and there was a nice, gentle breeze coming in from the window as I worked. Once I had gathered sufficient garbage to be disposed of, I walked over to the window and I closed it before leaving the room to throw all these items into the dumpster. These windows were what I would call crank windows, meaning that you needed a small handle to operate the crank so the window would swing open outward. Usually, the handle is removed from the windows to prevent the residents from opening the windows and venturing into the gated courtyard without anyone knowing. Unfortunately, this was a lesson learned the hard way a few times. Before leaving the room, I had removed the handle as well, just in case someone made their way into the room I was currently working in. It wasn't likely, as the door was locked, but I didn't take many chances, as some of the residents were rather crafty. I put the garbage into the large bin and returned to the room. As I entered, I immediately noticed that the window that I had closed was now open. Ah, I must not have latched it, I thought to myself. Then I continued to collect more garbage to throw out. This time before leaving, I closed and latched the window. I went to the garbage bin and threw away the trash I collected, returning to the room and once again, that window was open. Now a bit more puzzled by the situation, I just stood there for a moment, staring at the open window. After I had sufficiently looked at this window with no answers, I ventured over to the nurse assistant's area and asked my friend Mandy if she or any of the other nurse assistants had gone into room 11. She replied, No, we know you're working in there, and we don't really feel like getting covered in drywall dust, or whatever else has accumulated in there over the years. She then sees the confusion on my face. She asks what's going on. Instead of explaining everything, I ask her to come with me for a second. After some hesitation, she agreed to follow me to room 11. 
We both walked into the room, and I pointed at the window that was currently open. She just looked at me like, yeah, good job, that's indeed an open window. I walked over to the window and attached a handle to close it. Having successfully closed the window, I then showed Mandy that it's latched as well. I led her outside the room, and while standing outside with the door closed, I said, Now, you saw me close and latch the window, right? She nodded, still confused. I then unlocked the door and opened it. We both almost couldn't believe our eyes. The window was wide open. Mandy looked at me and said, Very funny. I'll bet your boss is hiding in here and you're just trying to prank me. She begins looking around the room and the closet and bathroom, yet finds no one. We both just kind of stood there for a moment. Then Mandy broke the silence. Do it again. So I walk over to the window, closing and latching it. But this time, Mandy herself checks the latch to make sure it's actually latched. We then stepped outside the room once again for maybe 30 seconds, then opened the door. Behold, the window was open once again. In my mind, I wanted to say some sort of cheesy catchphrase like, Ta-da! as if I had anything to do with this phenomenon. We both said nothing, though, for several minutes, until Mandy just turned and walked away, giving some excuse like she's got to be back to work. I thought she was lucky, as my work was in that room for the day. Day two and three in the room were just a repeat of the first day. The fourth day was not, however. While replacing some of the electrical outlets by the window, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, and when I looked, it was of course the window opening. By this point, I had almost accepted the phenomenon, but I remember one very crucial thing. These windows were old, or the same age as the building. That would mean the cranks were too, and they wore out, which also could lead them to not holding or even opening on themselves, possibly. I stopped doing electrical and ran upstairs to the maintenance office to grab a new crank assembly for the window. It took me about 20 minutes total to remove the old crank and put a brand new one on. Then I tested the window several times, opening it, closing it, making sure there weren't any slips in the gears and that it was strong. Finally, content with my work, I latched the window closed and stood there for a moment to see if the window would open. It didn't. I thought myself a fool for getting spooked by such a silly thing as an old window crank assembly. I chuckled at myself as I continued to work on the electrical in the room. I was replacing the electrical outlet right below the window when, suddenly, I felt a cold breeze envelop me. I looked up, and I saw the window unlatched and wide open again. I don't know how long I sat there, looking at this window being wide open. My jaw was probably on the floor, as I was so shocked, having believed the problem was solved. That window continued to open itself throughout almost all the remodeling. The carpet guys had even asked me if I believed the facility was haunted. It wasn't until later that I found out one of the carpet guys had watched the window open and close itself right in front of him. I thought this was rather odd. I'd only seen the window open, not close itself. After the carpet guy's experience of the window opening and closing, there wasn't anything else. It was almost as if whatever it was just needed a bit of fresh air during all that remodeling. Intruder in the Grapevines From So Nora A couple of summers ago, I ended up working in the small garden outside my work due to our workload slowing down in the summer. I worked at a factory that was surrounded by olive trees and other trees like apricot, peach, cherry, pear, and apple trees. Beyond the tree line, on one of the short ends of the small rectangular garden, there were a bunch of tall, thick weeds and shrubbery. On the garden fence itself at that end, 
thick tangled grapevines had overgrown on the fence for the garden and on the chain link perimeter fence for the property line in that area. It was a particularly hot day as it was July. The hummingbirds buzzed near the feeders and other birds were singing their summer songs. I greeted our factory dog, Buddy, who was lazing outside the garden in the shade of an olive tree. He gazed up at me with his neon-like blue eyes and wagged his black and white fluffy tail at me, before dozing off again. I continued to chat at Buddy as I worked, just off in my own safe little world. As I worked, though, I began to vaguely notice the sounds of bushes and shrubbery rustling slightly, which I blew off as just the breeze. But after a few minutes more, I realized the rustling sounds were pretty constant, and after briefly glancing around myself at the other trees, I noticed there didn't appear to be any breeze that hot July day. I then figured it was probably Buddy, sniffing around in the bushes or something like that. But then as I turned back towards the garden entrance for a shovel, there was Buddy. He was still lazing around in the same place. Now, if you know dogs, then you know that Buddy should have been losing his crap right then. Yet, he was just resting there. I decided to give it a couple of more minutes, just to make sure. It could have been my husband, who also worked at the factory with me, or it could have been my boss or another co-worker, for all I knew. But as I nonchalantly paid attention to what I was hearing, I could tell that the movements were slow and deliberate. Whoever or whatever was in the grapevines and bushes was moving precisely. My heart began to race as I imagined a bear or a mountain lion stalking me. I then sneaked out of the garden entrance, stepping over a couple of feet to investigate. It was pretty difficult to see through the thick shrubbery beyond the olive and cherry trees. I had to really focus, like when you try to see one of those hidden 3D images. Once I focused though, I started to see movement beyond the grapevines and bushes and weeds. After a few seconds, I began to make out the shape of human legs. Whoever was in there was wearing a pair of medium fade blue jeans and black hiking or maybe work boots. All I could think at the moment was, holy crap, there's someone in there. They were moving away from me and towards the railroad tracks beyond the chain link perimeter fence. All I could think to do at that point was to walk around the perimeter fence and up to the railroad tracks to see this person from a slight vantage point. I knew they would be trapped by the perimeter fence, which was hidden by the grapevines. Once I got up there, I saw the man crouched down next to the chain link fence, staring right back at me. It was so strange to me what he was wearing, as it was over 100 degrees out that day. He'd be extremely hot wearing all that. As he stared at me with dark, beady, close-set eyes, I managed to ask him, Uh, who are you, and why are you here? Instead of answering, he simply continued to stare at me, unblinking. His face pale, he didn't say a word to me. He sat there frozen. Looking back, I don't think he actually blinked or moved one bit. So I gave up after a few seconds and went into the factory to tell somebody about it. I found my husband first, but he pretty much just dismissed it. So then I went to my boss. Together we both went back out to the garden to investigate, but no one was there then just a buddy casually wandering into the bushes towards the tracks. Buddy, being a dog, should have been alarmed, and yet he wasn't, which was weird to my boss as well. Just then, my other co-worker arrived with his dog, who was promptly sent to investigate the area. Meanwhile, the other co-worker went inside the factory to get the forklift, which he drove outside to us. Then we had my husband lift the forklift as high as he could, while my other co-worker stood on the forks to have a vantage point to be able to really get a good look around for the guy, or maybe even a car leaving or something of the sort. But he didn't find anything. 
Once we got back inside the factory, in my boss's air-conditioned office, the boss had something interesting to tell us about the night before. First off, he informed us all that we had no running water in the whole industrial park. The interesting part came when he explained why there was no water. Apparently, the night before, a couple of guys tried to steal a big rig from one of the businesses located up past us in the park. When they tried to escape with the truck after nearly getting caught, they tried to jump the thing across a small creek where the water main coming into the industrial park happened to be. They of course didn't make it, and they ended up smashing the water main to all the businesses in the park. I have no real idea if the intruder amongst the grapevines was related to that incident or not, but we did end up calling the sheriff, just in case. They came out and took a report, getting a description of the intruder from me. Of course, none of the outside security cameras caught it, since it was behind the tree line and amongst the heavy shrubbery. So I guess I'll never really know. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an eerie cast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at eeriecast.com.